in this installment, we're going to begin to look at the Greek words underlying the word Godhead in the King James Bible. In Acts 17.29, the Godhead is a translation of ta thion. In Romans 1.20, Godhead is a translation of theotes. And in Colossians 2.9, the Godhead is a translation of tes theotetas. So we're going to be examining ta thion, theotes, and theotetas. We're going to split this up into three videos just to make it a little bit easier. So today we're only going to be covering Acts 17.29. Again, like in the last video, our question is, what does Godhead mean in each use? So we're going to look at uses of the word in the original language, uses of the word in the translated language, context of the use in the passage, and larger theological understanding if need be. From the previous installment, we found that Godhead doesn't have all the meaning that Denlinger really needs it to and pushes on his followers. From the examples that we looked at, Webster's 1828 Dictionary does accurately reflect the typical meanings of the word. And from those examples, we found that Godhead is not an exclusively Christian term, nor is it an exclusively King James Bible term, and certainly doesn't necessarily include the meaning that they ascribe to it. So let's begin looking at our first occurrence, Acts 17.29, and the original language phrase, Tothion. Right, this is all the information provided in BDAG, or the Bauer, Donker, Arndt, and Gingrich lexicon. We're only going to consider the first point of these three main definitions, as it alone is relevant here. Just so you're aware, the three definitions are, one, pertaining to that which belongs to the nature or status of deity, or divine, Second, of persons who stand in close relation to or reflect characteristics of a deity, including especially helpfulness to one's constituents, divine, and then generally of that which exceeds the bounds of human or earthly possibility, which is supernatural. Now, under the first definition, we have two grammatical uses. First, adjectively, divine, and then second, substantively, and here gives divine being or divinity. These are all the examples listed under adjectively, but we're only going to look at a couple of them. First, divine dynamis, or power. Second Peter 1.3 says, According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. Next, physis, or nature. The following verse, Second Peter 1.4 whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Next, crisis, or judgment. From Second Clement 20, verse 4. For if God paid the wages of the righteous immediately, we would soon be engaged in business, not godliness. Though we would appear to be righteous, we would in fact be pursuing not piety, but profit. And this is why the divine judgment punishes a spirit that is not righteous and loads it with chains. Next for gnosis, knowledge. 1 Clement 41. Since therefore these things are now clear to us, and we have searched into the depths of the divine knowledge, we ought to do, in order, everything that the Master has commanded us to perform at the appointed times. Next for pneuma, or spirit. We have the shepherd of Hermas, from Mandates 11.2 and uh, several other occurrences. Verse 2, The double-minded come to him as to a fortune teller and ask him what will happen to them. And that false prophet, not having the power of a divine spirit in himself, answers them in accordance with their questions and their wicked desires and fills their souls just as they themselves wish. In 5, For no spirit given by God needs to be consulted. Instead, having the divine power, it speaks everything on its own initiative because it is from above, from the power of the divine spirit. And then in 7, So how, sir, I asked, will a person know which of them is a prophet and which is a false prophet? Here, he said, about both the prophets, and on the basis of what I am going to tell you, you can test the prophet and the false prophet. Determine the man who has the divine spirit by his life. Verse 9, So then, when the person who has the divine spirit comes into an assembly of righteous people, who have faith in a divine spirit, etc. Next, erga, or works. Again, Shepherd of Hermas, this is vision 3, 8, verse 7. Their works, therefore, are pure and reverent and divine. Secondly, we have substantively, or 
divine being divinity. Again, these are all the examples listed in the lexicon, but we'll only look at a sampling of them again. First from Xenophon, Chiropedia 4215. As they proceeded, night came on, and it is said that a light from heaven shone forth upon Cyrus and his army, so that they were all filled with awe at the miracle. In this translation, it's translated as the miracle, but in the original text, it is our phrase ta thion. Again, Xenophon, Hellenica 7513. And those in the van of Epaminondas' army were slain, but when the troops from within the city, exulting in their victory, pursued farther than was fitting, they in their turn were slain. For as it seems, the line had been drawn by the deity, indicating how far victory had been granted to them. Again from Xenophon, Memorabilia 1418. Then you will know that such is the greatness and such the nature of the deity that he sees all things and hears all things alike and is present in all places and heedful of all things. Next, Plato's Phaedrus, 242c. And I thought I heard a voice from which it forbade my going away before clearing my conscience, as if I had committed some sin against deity. Next, in Lucian, De Sacrifices, 1. He will first have a question to ask himself. Is he to call them devout worshippers, or very outcasts, who think so meanly of God as to suppose that he can require anything at the hand of man, can take pleasure in their flattery, or be wounded by their neglect? In this translation, it is translated as God. In the original Greek, of course, it is, again, ta thion. Next, in Pro Imaginibus 13. So, in this sort of portraiture, the human is not so much exalted by the similitude as the divine is belittled and pulled down. And in 17, for those will be the best in human relations who are most earnest in their dealings with the divine. And then 28, if what I wrote contains anything offensive to the deity, you are not responsible unless you consider we are responsible for all that goes in at our ears. Next in Athanagoras' A Plea for the Christians from chapter 1, but for us who are called Christians, you have not in like manner cared, but although we commit no wrong, nay, as will appear in the sequel of this discourse, are of all men most piously and righteously disposed towards the deity and towards your government, you allow us to be harassed, plundered, and persecuted, the multitude making war upon us for our name alone. Next, we're going to look at Acts 17.27 and Codex D, Beze Cantabrigiensis. Now, on the right, we have the Byzantine text which at verse 27 reads, Zetain ton kurion. On the left, we have the Nestle on 28, which Denlinger references but never actually shows you. Uh, but there it says, Zetain ton theon. Below, we have the critical apparatus, which lists our Byzantine reading, Zetain ton kurion. And then for Codex D, it lists, Melista Zetain ta theon estim. Finally, the manuscript supporting the reading of the main text. And in manuscript D itself, we see in the unsealed text, Melista Zetain Ta Thion Estin. Next, we have a variant reading in Titus 1 9, 13th century manuscript 460, trilingual, so it is Greek with Arabic and Latin. According to Metzger, it reads Do not appoint those who have married twice or make them deacons, and do not take wives in a second marriage. Let them not come to serve the deity at the altar. As God's servant reprove the rulers who are unjust judges and robbers and liars and unmerciful. And then finally, we have our occurrence in Acts 17.29. Now the larger passage reads, Now while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. Therefore disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons and in the market daily with them that met with him. Then certain philosophers of the Epicureans and of the Stoics encountered him. And some said, What will this babbler say? Others some, He seemeth to be a setter forth of strange gods, because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him unto Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new doctrine whereof thou speakest is? For thou bringest certain strange things to our ears. We would know, therefore, what these things mean. For all the Athenians and strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. 
Whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. Neither is worshipped with men's hands, as though he needed any thing, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things, and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation, that they should seek the Lord, if haply they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone, graven by art and man's device. And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent, because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, in that he hath raised him from the dead. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, and others said, We will hear thee again of this matter. In this passage, Paul encounters Epicurean and Stoic philosophers who think he is speaking of strange gods, specifically because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. They bring him to the Areopagus so he can explain more to them. Building off their own recognition that there is an unknown God they worship, he declares the true God to them. He says that God created all that exists, creation ex nihilo. He is Lord of heaven and earth, God's sovereign authority and providence over his creation. He does not dwell in man-made temples based on God's spiritual nature and omnipresence. He's not worshipped with men's hands. God is actuous purus and impassable. He does not gain anything from something outside himself. Because to receive and be bettered by men's worship is unfitting to God because he is the one that gives life and breath to all things. He has made all the nations from Adam. He determined their times beforehand. He determined the lands they would live in. It is man's duty to seek God. God is not far from mankind, not only by his omnipresence and immensity, whereby he is everywhere, but by his power in supporting all in their being, and by his goodness in continually communicating the blessings of providence to them. And he again is the one that gives life. Our being and movement is in God. Paul cites their own poets, but applies their statements to the true God. Paul then moves to the duty man has in regarding God. Speaking not just of his pagan listeners, he says that since all men are the offspring of God, we ought not to regard that the Godhead is like a graven image. For so to think of God is to think very unworthily of him. For if to think thus of ourselves, who are descended from him, would be a debasing of us, then much more to think so of God, the Father of spirits, must be a depreciating of him. Paul then says that the times of pagan ignorance and worshipping of idols in the past God winked at, not that he approved of or encouraged the idolatry, but that as just punishment in the past, he did not send them a revelation or prophets to correct them. He left them to their folly. But now all men are commanded to repent, for the day is coming when all will be judged in righteousness by the man he ordained, that is, Jesus Christ, to assure men that this coming judgment is sure and that Jesus will judge in righteousness, he raised him from the dead. And what we've seen from the ancient uses of Tathion and the context of the passage, Paul was certainly not expounding a three-parted God to the Athenians. It seems most appropriate to understand Godhead to refer to the deity here, and that is in accordance with the definitions of Godhead. Denlier cannot rest upon this passage as proof of his doctrine of God. 